When righteous people pray, Psalm 18, verses 7 through 20, it's part of that psalm, not the whole psalm itself, but a very important part of it. What we would discover is that God wants to have a major role in our lives and spiritually to bring us peace. That's part of that abundant life that I talked about this morning from John chapter 10, where Jesus said that he has come to give us life and to have life more abundantly. Each part of that is peace, just a peace knowing that we can get through this world with all the things that are happening and know that God is on our side and that we can be on God's side. Romans chapter 8, verse 28, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to His purpose. And, and the point of that is, God is working those things together. Even the bad things. Now, bad things are going to happen. Bad things are going to come into our lives. Trials, tribulations, things that we don't want to be there, but, but they're going to be there. How we work through those things is very important, but our relationship with God <clears throat> depends on us allowing Him to make the very best of those situations. So in our lesson tonight, David tells us that God answers the prayers of the righteous. So if we want God to work all of these things going on in our lives, and sometimes it's a pretty big storm, if we want Him to work these things together for our good, we need to be righteous. And we need to pray. Because God answers the prayers of the righteous. So why is that important? Because when righteous people pray, great power is released. Uh, we're, we're going through batteries for a remote control for our TV like crazy. And I don't know if the shelf life on the batteries was bad when we bought them, what the deal is. Maybe it was just bad batteries, but it seems like every week I'm putting batteries in that one remote control it's just you know like crazy but but you know you got to put the batteries in there to get the power out of them you, you've got to hook them up to something for the power to be released that's what prayer does for righteous people it releases a great Power. Psalm 18, verse 7. David, as he's talking about this, says, Then the earth reeled and rocked. That sounds like an earthquake, doesn't it? The foundations also of the mountains trembled and quaked because he, that's God, was angry. What was God angry about? Well, I'm sure that God was angry about sin because that's what God makes God angry. Sin makes God angry. And especially sin against God's people. We remember in Acts chapter 7 when Stephen comes under intense persecution. He's being called names, they're arguing with him, they're stoning him, and he looks up and he sees the Lord standing at the right hand of God, not sitting, but standing, that the Lord sees what's going on and is concerned about it. That's the type of situation that we have going on here. Now, God moves heaven and earth to make good things happen for his children. 
oh, why did he let that happen to Stephen then? Why, why did he allow Stephen to be stoned? Well, think about where Stephen is now as a martyr. Stephen fulfilled his role, and Stephen has a place in glory because of that. Something good comes out of that evil act of people. But something else good came out of that because remember where the men laid their coats, the ones who stoned Stephen, at the feet of a man named Saul, Saul of Tarsus, who later is converted. And probably because some of the things that he went through, maybe conscience, because of what he was doing to these Christians. Then again, meeting Jesus on the road to Damascus didn't hurt any either, did it? <laughs> but political changes, oppression or freedom, all these things play into this. Think of Israel in Egypt for 400 years. When they first go down to Egypt, everything's fine, right? Because Joseph has Pharaoh's ears. He's second in command in the whole nation, and the nation's doing great, and he puts his relatives in one particular area, segregated kind of from the Egyptians. They got this one area, it's a fertile area. They can grow, their, their food is growing, their herds are growing. They're going good until there arises a Pharaoh who did not know Joseph. That's a political change, isn't it? And they become slaves. That's oppression of loss of freedom. So those changes that took place there caused great strain on the people of Israel. And what they took for granted, the blessings that they took for granted, then they start praying to God. God, help us. And God does. There are times of social changes. Darkness and light, right? That's, that's what we look at throughout the world, the social changes. Remember, we talked about this morning in, in Bible class about that stream of consciousness, a, con a stream of common sense that this is how the world works. And you get outside of that, you have chaos. You think about that, that darkness and light, the, the flash that is there. And you think about Lot, how he went from being with Abraham, and even though there were constant, uh, there was constant turmoil with Abraham's uh, shepherds and herdsmen, and Lot's shepherds and herdsmen, the separation that took place between Abraham and Lot seemed good at the time. Lot got the greater material part of it, right? But he ends up over by Sodom. And you think about that social change that took place there. And the book of Hebrews tells us that Lot's righteous soul was vexed day by day because of the sin that he had to witness there in Sodom and Gomorrah. That's more of that stuff that goes on within society that causes not peace, but chaos, turmoil. There are economic changes that people go through and that, that you know, what do you have? You have hunger or prosperity. I'm sorry, there are places in the world today where people are starving to death, where there's famines. Our nation tries to help. Sometimes politics plays a role in not getting help there. There are places of prosperity. We understand that. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 12, I know how to be brought low, I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. And I don't know if we really hit a bottom to where we're hungry. But we're hungry. I mean, physically hungry. 
Are we hungry for God? Are we hungry for spiritual things? Then there are psychological changes that come into play. Fear or peace. Are we living in fear or are we living in that peace? It seems that there are so many elements out here in our world today that want to cause us to live in fear. Fear of things that we can't even see. The fear of things we can't control, right? Philippians 4, 6 and, 6 and 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So, yeah, fear, fear needs to be taken away. How? Why? Praying to God. When we pray to God, that means we trust in God, we believe in God, we put uh, God there for our hope that these things that are going on around us, we say, yeah, I can't do anything about it. God can. And if God doesn't, God's right in what he does do. God is right in what he doesn't do. But in the end, if I'm righteous, God's going to take care of me. And that gives me a peace that passes the understanding that people of this world don't have. People in this world, you just think of it, people who are fighting, people who are arguing, people who are calling names, people, you should be wearing a mask. Why aren't you wearing a mask? You're killing people because you're not wearing a mask. People don't know what to believe. They don't know how to act. They're so afraid afraid and fearful of things that they absolutely have no control over. You know, God has control. Think about this power that God has. Psalm 18, verses 8 and 9, smoke went up from his nostrils, devouring fire from his mouth, glowing coals flamed forth from him. He bowled the heavens and came down. Thick darkness was under his feet. <laughs> Is that awesome? I remember years ago at the congregation where we had some young folks and we used to uh, do a little pew packers deal and uh, we, we sang the songs and there was this one young fella, he loved the song about God with lightning in his fists and thunder in his feet, you know. He just loved that. That's See this power that David is talking about is something that's unseen with human eyes. We take it by faith that God has his God has his power to subdue even the demonic forces that are out here. But he wants us to pray about it. He expects us to pray about it. Now we can't see it. In 2 Kings chapter 6, there's a battle taking place and, and it, 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 it's just the enemy is around some of the children of Israel. Elisha the prophet is there, and they're surrounded. And, and Elisha's servant is saying, oh, this is terrible. Look at this. We're going to be killed. We're, we're going to be destroyed. Oh, you know, this is terrible. And Elisha says, oh, Lord, he prays. Oh, Lord, I wish his eyes, or I'm praying his eyes be opened up so he can see the forces that are behind there. And his eyes are open, and he sees the host of God's army the angelic armies that are surrounding God's people. Elisha could see them some way, somehow. But there they were. And it calmed the servant down. We don't know what for. 
forces God has around us protecting us, preparing the way before us. We know the Holy Spirit goes to prepare the way, but what forces is He to you? What forces is He you? I don't know how the proper verb it even works in that case, but, but what's He using? Psalm 18, verses 10 and 11. He rode on a cherub and flew. You know what a cherub is? A, a, a cherub is one of those guardian type angelic beings, not, not an angel, but it's got six wings and it's an awesome creature, being. And he's riding on that. He flew. He came swiftly on the wings of the wind. He made darkness his covering, his canopy around him. Thick clouds, dark with water. The enemy doesn't even see him coming. There he is. And those angelic forces work behind the scenes to do God's will. In Daniel chapter 10, Daniel sees a vision of God working in the future for God's, excuse me, God's people. And what he saw terrified him. Here's Daniel who's seen vision after vision after vision, interpreted dream after dream after dream. What he sees terrifies him. If Daniel was terrified, what would it do to me? <laughs> you know? Psalm 18, verses 12 through 13. Out of the brightness before him, hailstones. Hailstones. What are hailstones made out of? Ice. Ice. And coals of fire. What? Hailstones and coals of fire? Fire and ice? A couple different extremes there, right? Broke through the clouds. And the Lord also thundered in the heavens, and the Most High uttered His voice, hailstones and coals of fire. See, those things symbolize the power of God and even the destructive force of God against those things that, that are evil, against those things that oppose Him, and against those things that oppose His righteous people. Now, back to Exodus chapter 20, verse 18. This is when the Lord comes down on Mount Sinai to give Moses the Ten Commandments. Now when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled and they stood far off. They had just seen mighty things happened to the Egyptians. The ten plagues. They saw the Egyptians drowned in the Red Sea. They'd seen God provide for them on their journey from the Red Sea to Mount Sinai. But yet when the Lord came down to Mount Sinai, and this power was unleashed. They didn't want to be around it. They were so afraid. Kind of reminds me of Isaiah when he's in the temple. Remember? He's in the temple. He sees this vision. He says, oh, I'm undone because I'm a man of unclean lips. Now, be careful what you say, right? Because you know what happens then? A, a seraphim, another one of those creatures, sit and touches Isaiah's lips. Your lips are clean now. Mm. We cannot imagine the power of God.
prayer releases the power of God. That's what David is trying to tell us. So God wants righteous people to pray. God cannot offer or cannot answer prayers that are not offered. Right? James 2, uh, 4, 2 and 3. James chapter 4, verse 2 and 3. You desire, you do not have, so you murder. You covet, but cannot obtain, so you fight the world. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. That's what James is telling the, 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 the folks back, back in the first century, right? We've got to remember the power of prayer and, and the basis of prayer is faith and righteousness. So we need to offer those prayers. God will not listen to prayers from people with impure hearts and unclean hands. He won't listen to them. Okay? Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2. Behold, the Lord's hand is not short that he cannot save, or his ear dull that he cannot hear. Isaiah says, But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Now, what was Isaiah talking about? What, what was Isaiah trying to show the people? Well, remember, Isaiah was preaching, prophesying at a time when the northern kingdom was about to be destroyed, right? And what was the northern kingdom's problem? They'd gotten into idolatry. As a religion, Plus, they were seeking to make peace treaties with nations around them instead of trusting in the Lord. So they didn't have clean hands and pure hearts. And Isaiah says, God's not going to listen to you. You'll be destroyed because of it. Now, in the face of all of that, Jesus taught his followers how to pray. Taught us we must pray, right? Matthew 7, 7 and 8. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. What does that mean? Here's how you get action. You got to plug it in. Right? You got to plug it in. You got to got access to power. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And the one who knocks. And to the one who knocks, it will be open. So we've got something we have to do. In Luke chapter 18, verse 1, Jesus told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. Don't give up. Don't give up. Psalm 18, verses 16 and 17. He sent from on high. He took me. He drew me out of many waters. Remember what waters represents? Uh, the, the sea of humanity. But typically when there's storms on the waters, it's the chaotic problems and stuff that humanity's facing and what does he do he takes me out he drew me out of these waters he rescued me from my strong enemy and from those who hated me for they were too mighty for me they were more than i could handle the the, the burdens were more than i could handle myself so i energized this power of prayer I used that, and he got me out of it. The, whatever means it was, but maybe he was still there, but he found peace in the midst of all of that. He found that peace that passes understanding because God's in control. And if the worst thing would happen to him, be the best thing that could ever happen. 
if the worst earthly thing that happened to him could be the best heavenly thing that could ever happen to him. Prayer from pure heart, from pure hearts and clean hands brings peace. peace. Why? Because pure hearts and clean hands ask ask the right way ask for the right things just like James says just like Jesus was teaching in the Sermon on the Mount remember when we were in Bible class how many things does James go over that goes directly back to the Sermon on the Mount there's a bunch of them in that little booklet right that says you know that shows it so Psalm 18, verses 18 and 19. They confronted me in the day of my calamity. Who did? Well, the enemies did. But the Lord was my support. He held me up. He brought me out into a broad place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. And, and we talked about that before, right? A broad place, but... Sometimes we feel like we're on a ledge, right? With no place to go. Did you ever get on the internet and see some of those places? Maybe there's a big, uh, like a uh, caterpillar backhoe type power shovel deal, and it's working its way up the side of a mountain. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> it's, Oh, somebody got some nerve there, don't they? Well, sometimes in life we feel like that, that we're on this ledge and there's nowhere to go. The enemy's all around us and it's just like, I just want to jump. I just jump and get it over with. David says he brought me out into a broad place where I could turn around, I could look around. And the enemies backed off. Do you know what that? Again, that's that place of peace, isn't it? But what was the reason? Why did God do it? Look at the very last part of that. Because he delighted in. Why did he delight in him? What's the title of the lesson? When righteous people pray. Make sure we're doing it right for righteousness. So consider some things. Number one, David had a problem with King Saul, didn't he? It's more like King Saul had a problem with David. God solved that problem, right? With the Philistines. The Philistines solved the problem. 1 Kings chapter 31. Jesus was able to commit all to the Father in Gethsemane, according to Luke 22, 39 through 46. How's Jesus going to save the world? By offering himself as a sacrifice. How's he going to do that? He's going to let the enemy think they won. Did they win? Did the devil win? No, uh, he thought he did. He probably partied that night, didn't he? There's not a chapter 31 in 1 Kings. There isn't? Well, it's somewhere else then. <laughs> <laughs> Just thought you might want to put a check mark by that. <laughs> Thank you. I wouldn't. I'll, I'll check that. <laughs> Stephen was able to see behind the scenes when he was attacked. We talked about that earlier. He, the, uh, he, he was able to see into heaven and see the Lord standing at the right hand of the throne of God. God took care of the problem. How did he do that? He converted some of those who were the enemies. So. Pure hearts, clean hands. That's what God delights in. God wants to hear us. 
No, we cannot see him. We can't see the spiritual forces that he uses to bring about the good in our lives. But he wants to hear us. God wants to help us. And he's got all the resources that uh, to give us that, that we need to make things possible. God wants to heal us so that our prayers can be heard. Wait a minute, I, I thought we prayed for healing. Well, sometimes we have to be healed spiritually before our prayers can be healed or be heard so that we can be healed in other ways. And his help be brought into our lives. He wants to heal us. He wants to take away our sins. He wants to. We just have to do our part to access this great power. We must pray faithfully. And belief and repentance must be part of parcel of our lives. Not just the initial part of our spiritual life, but the continual part of our lives. Be faithful in the dead.